Thank you, Teresa. And welcome, Sherry, to the IQ Sensor Net product line. Uh, so, welcome everyone on the line today. Thank you for taking t time out of your busy afternoon to attend uh, our webinar. Uh, thank you for doing so. We aim to provide you with some very useful information uh, that will definitely make this worth your time. It's going to, as, as the title states, it's going to be concerning how to improve your wastewater treatment process performance and save money with online process monitoring. On the title screen here, we have a couple images for uh, customers we're going to feature in today's webinar. The bottom left is John Wright with Littleton Ingwood Wastewater Treatment Plant in Colorado, holding up some ORP sensors that they use to control their chloramine disinfection process. On the bottom right, then, is a optical nitrate sensor installed at the 26th Ward Wastewater Treatment Plant in New York City that they use to help them control carbon dosing for denitrification. Um, the uh, NitroViz is a very useful nitrate sensor, which uh, unlike other probes, the measuring gap is actually right there in the middle. I just want to bring that up because it will be important to know later on in the presentation. So why, why bother with process monitoring? My plant's running fine. Well, perhaps. Water goes in and water comes out the other end, and it looks pretty good when it comes out. looks better than it, when it went in, anyway. But how good is it? Does it meet all the regulations and the scrutiny that are going to be coming? Can you trim your operating costs? How does it handle flow and load fluctuations? Are your process control decisions based on anecdotes, or are they data-driven? Maybe the most important reason for online process monitoring is to ensure a good night's sleep. At least that's what one of our customers who recently started monitoring their nitrification, denitrification process with varying sensors told me. We'll be featuring these case studies this afternoon on various applications at various locations throughout the U.S. Uh, chemical P removal with the P700 phosphate analyzer, uh, sludge wasting control with the V-solid TSS sensors, aeration control using the FDO optical DO sensor, uh, chloramine disinfection control with ORP and amylite ammonium sensors, and New York City Department of Environmental Protection denitrification carbon dosing control with the NitroViz and NitroLite. The first application we'll talk about this afternoon is chemical P, P as in phosphorus, removal. Chemical phosphorus removal is a fairly simple uh, process that actually is uh, more detailed when you look closer at it, but it involves adding chemical to the water and forming uh, flocks, and these flocks are called HMOs, or hydrous metal oxides. And so as these flocks are formed, adsorbed soluble P uh, adsorbs to the flocks, and then as the flocks continue to grow, uh, particulate P gets trapped, and so when these flocks settle out, they are removed with waste sludge. The Fox River Water Pollution Control Center in Brookfield, Wisconsin is a uh, water resource recovery facility that uses chemical P removal. A little bit about uh, Brookfield and Fox River. Uh, Brookfield is geographically unique. It straddles a subcontinental divide. And basically what this means is that on the east side of the city, wastewater flows to uh, Milwaukee's system. But on the west side of the city, uh, wastewater flows to the Fox River Water Pollution Control Center shown here. Um, and as, as you can see, it's, it's an activated sludge plant. Uh, one of the buildings in there is, is tertiary filtration, which is important to know because that's where the phosphate analyzer is located. It's designed for an average daily flow of 12.5 million gallons per day, but the plant can handle peak, peak weather, wet weather flows of up to 50 MGD. Now, the data I'm showing here are uh, data 
before and after installation of the P700 phosphate analyzer and incorporation of it into the uh, chemical control system. So in 2013, the year before the analyzer was installed, alum usage was around 100,000 gallons that year uh, to produce effluent TP of around 0.7 milligram per liter at a cost for alum of about $122,000. In 2015, the first full year after installation of the analyzer, the um, alum usage was reduced by 10%, uh, producing still a similar effluent quality, around 0.7 milligram per liter, but at a much lower cost of around $104,000 that year. The uh, strategy that uh, Brookfield uses to remove phosphorus is called uh, simultaneous precipitation. It's a very uh, common method where chemical is added to the activated sludge system. In this case, uh, the chemical is added down between the aeration tank and the final settling tank, and that chemical is alum. And so the uh, precipitated HMOs with the uh, adsorbed soluble P and the entrapped particulate P are settled out in the final settling tank and then removed with a waste activated sludge. This is a picture of the analyzer installed at, at Brookfield uh, showing uh, many of the features of the analyzer. It is a, it is a cabinet style wet chemistry analyzer um, meant to be outdoors but in this case stored in, uh, located inside the tertiary filtration building. Uh, to protect it from the very harsh Wisconsin winters. There is a sample pump inside here uh, and another in a little uh, overflow vessel where the sa sample goes into and the photometer pump draws from there and also from the reagent bottles, uh, cleaning agent bottles, and phosphate standard bottles. The cleaning and uh, calibration are done automatically. Outside then is the 2020 XT uh, controller which displays the reading and allows uh, the programming of the unit. The sample for the system is taken from the uh, effluent channel downstream, so the tertiary filtration effluent channel below, and uh, it's, it's sucked up through, this is actually, a, there's a small tubing inside this tubing right here that draws up the sample through a, uh, a filter, which uh, pulled out of the channel for convenience here. Uh, this is a 0.45 micron uh, pore size filter, which uh, the sample pump inside the analyzer basically sucks the sample through the filter and up through the tubing. It's a lightweight filter and it's, uh, it's lowered in the channel with that slide rail in the picture. Their chemical dosing control system is uh, a floating point control system, and let me let me explain what that means. It's not much different from the, the the steps we all take before we hop in the shower in the morning. So some features of this are a timed response, a direct acting, dead band, and and biased response. I'll I'll explain all of those, but. As before you hop in the shower in the morning, you'll, you'll turn on the water at some level and try to guess, make a good guess, and you'll reach your hand in there to, to make sure it's comfortable. If it's not comfortable, you'll adjust the, uh, the water valves accordingly, and maybe if you're far away from comfort, still pretty cold, you might make a bigger adjustment, as opposed to if you think you're getting close, you'll make a small adjustment. Um, but you know, ultimately, uh, your your aim is to get it, it close enough. It may not be the exact same exact temperature, but it's it's one that's um, comfortable with you to to get in. So, if we look at a at an algorithm for that uh, process, starting with this box right here, uh, it starts with calculating an error, and that error is the difference between the operator selected set point and the process variable. In this case, uh, that's phosphate. And so uh, comparing that error to a dead band, and a dead band is just that area of, in, in the shower analogy, of that, those, that range of temperatures which you feel comfortable and which you won't bother to adjust the uh, water valves anymore. And so if that uh, measurement is 
uh, greater than the dead band, then the next step is to evaluate that process uh, variable. If it's if it's high, um, uh, the response would be to um, decrease the manipulated variable. In this case, the manipulated variable is the chemical feed pump. So if your if your phosphate is is if uh, the error is high, you want to uh, decrease the manipulated variable. Whereas if uh, your error is not high, um, you would want to increase the manipulated variable. In any case, um, at the end of each step, you have a, a time delay, so that um, as in the shell, a little while to see if your um, to see just where that temperature is going to be before you make another change. So. This is a, a, a picture from the, the SCADA system there. A um, couple cur curves here. One of them is for the orthophosphate uh, concentration. And uh, you see that's the blue line. You see it varies from very low value up to around 2. And then the green line is actually the um, uh, chemical feed pump. Rate. So as the phosphate goes higher, the chemical feed pump goes higher. And then as the uh, phosphate concentration decreases, the uh, chemical feed pump rate decreases until it, it shuts off. Now, one optimization to this, and this is just kind of a superimposed line right here, is we can see that the uh, decreasing rate is the same as the increasing rate. And that may cause some inefficiency because uh, as we can see that despite the fact that the orthophosphate concentration is pretty low, um, the, ortho, the chemical feed pump is still pumping at a pretty high rate. Um, so uh, floating point control would allow this to come down faster than it goes up and provide even more optimization. So a lot of, a lot of flexibility with this type of control. Uh, a picture from the uh, control screen of the system, again we have they have four uh, chemical feed pumps, 701 through 704, uh, linked with one uh, analyzer. And so um, the programming is really done right here in this box. Um, here's the set point. In this case, they choose a set point of 0.65 milligram per liter. And they have a limit of 1 milligram per liter. So the 0.65 gives them a little safety factor uh, to account for, for example, the uh, particulate phosphorus, which is not measured by the phosphate analyzer. The dead band then, as I talked about, is in this case it's 0.05. So uh, the dead band is an area where no changes to the chemical feed rate are made, and that's in this case it would be um, uh, plus or minus 0.05. So in this example, from 0.6 to 0.7, there would be no changes to the uh, uh, there would be no changes to the chemical feed rate. The, uh, the timed response is shown here. In this case, it's 15 minutes. So every 15 minutes, there's an adjustment to that uh, chemical feed pump. And then the uh, adjustment is large or small, depending on how far away you are from the uh, set point. In this case, uh, these are both the same, though, um, point 0.1. So Above 0.1 is a, is a large adjustment. Below 0.1 is a small adjustment. As I said, uh, Brookfield's been using this analyzer for a couple of uh, years now, and they've, they've come up with a couple things that uh, might help other customers. And one is uh, they keep a spare filter in frame on hand, if you recall from the, the earlier picture there. Uh, they keep that complete assembly on hand, and they rotate the clean filter in when the uh, filter in the basin becomes fouled. Um, so when the, the fouled sensor is pulled out of, of the uh, channel, put into chemical cleaning, and got ready so the, the next time the filter in the channel gets clogged, they just exchange them out and repeat the process. So that's been very convenient. The next uh, application uh, to discuss today is for uh, sludge wasting control. And um, 
Sludge wasting control is uh, a way to control the retention time of the solids in your system. And so solids retention time is, is the parameter. Very simply, it's the biomass in the system divided by the biomass leaving the system, or stated another way, inventory over wastage. And so it's, it's a very simple calculation. Um, the volume of the aeration tank times the mixed liquor concentration divided by the flow of the waste activated sludge times the concentration of the waste activated sludge, uh, the XR. And then uh, also, um, some solids go out the effluent with the effluent flow. So simple rearrangement of this equation allows you to come up with a wastage flow rate. And that wastage flow rate is going to be for a operator selected SRT. So whatever the target SRT is, uh, you calculate a uh, unique uh, flow waste, uh, waste sludge flow rate. The customer we're featuring for this application is Johnson County, Kansas, the, uh, which is located in uh, suburban Kansas City. Uh, the Douglas L. Smith Middle Basin facility is one of six major facilities in the district and has a treatment capacity of 14.5 million gallons per day out of the county's total capacity of 62.2 million, million gallons per day. Uh, the Middle Basin plant is among the first in the Kansas City area to incorporate BNR technology to reduce its discharge of phosphorus and nitrogen. Another unique part of this plant is that um, they uh, have an anaerobic digester and a cogeneration system and also a fat oil and grease receiving station that they take fat those fog from restaurants and industries feed them to the digester to increase the captured biogas and that biogas is enough to uh, produce virtually all the plants annual energy operating energy the reason they're interested in SRT control is, is to, uh, and have been, is for settleability control. There's a lot of uh, uh, importance to maintaining uh, SRT control so that the sludge quality stays the same and you're able to get better, more consistent performance overall. Um, it's, it's not just the uh, total suspended solids, though, because phosphorus and nitrogen are embedded in those total suspended solids particles so that it's overall it's very consistent performance. The uh, strategy has worked pretty well. It's been part of a, a very successful operation there as recognized by the NACWA. Um, Douglas L. Smith was a 2015 Gold Peak Performance Award winner. The TSS, a couple of pictures from the TSS monitoring system there at the Middle Basin plant. On the left panel is a, uh, the controller for a uh, TSS probe, B-solids probe, installed in the aeration basin. And on the right panel is an, a V-solid inserted into the return activated sludge pipeline. So they're continuously uh, monitoring uh, mixed liquor suspended solids and RAS suspended solids. A graphic from their control system is shown here, a uh, few important details. So they've got a uh, continuous monitoring of solids, that's the blue line right here. And then the magenta line, which is kind of uh, just right b behind here, is the uh, calculated waste activated sludge control uh, flow rate. So that's, that's, the, uh, that's the output of the uh, control algorithm. And then the green line then is the actual waste activated sludge flow rate. So you can see that the uh, waste activated sludge flow is controlled very tightly over variable solids concentrations. And that's really important as the um, mixed liquor suspended solids may vary, um, but not at the same proportion as the solids retention time. Uh, a picture from the waste activated sludge control screen is shown here. Um, and so for this particular pump here, um, when it is in an auto control mode, it could be set to a constant 
for a variable. Uh, in constant mode, the operator would plug in a uh, set point, uh, constant set points of a flow uh, they wanted for the pump. But the normal operation is a variable. In this case, uh, it's not displayed here, but the system would calculate a flow set point based on manual enter values, the SRT, for example, and meter values. In this case, mixed liquor suspended solids return activated sludge suspended solids, and the effluent flow. And with all that information, they can directly implement that equation I showed you earlier and calculate the uh, flow rate. A couple other features of this control system uh, is this averaging period right here. Uh, it is in hours. And so basically the signal from the uh, probes is, is averaged to give a, a smoother response. Likewise with the effluent flow meter. So the instantaneous SRT is not based on an instantaneous readings. One other feature of this system I want to point out is that um, if the flow set point goes below the flow capacity of the pump or below a certain gallons per minute, the pump is switched to a cycle duration flow rate. So for instance, it'll run so many minutes every 60 minutes. And that enables them to achieve even lower flow and a greater, uh, greater flexibility in their waste activated sludge uh, pumping system. A couple tips for trouble-free operation. They've, uh, they've been running this system for about uh, 10 years now, and they've learned a lot about doing online monitoring and automation. And one of the important things that the operating engineer has pointed out to me is that is to build a long-term relationship with the operators and technicians that are going to be uh, uh, operating the plant. And said, uh, if, you, if you champion the cause and make it more of a, a, a bottom-up approach as opposed to a top-down, you get better buy-in and overall uh, better performance. From a measurement standpoint, uh, one thing that they discovered was that um, by having two probes, they're able actually to provide greater uh, reliability. So this equation right here is the equation that is used to calculate the waste activated sludge flow rate. And so if you can see the mixed liquor suspended solids and the total suspended solids uh, are um, if, if they foul at the similar rate, those changes are going to cancel one another out and give a more stable performance. It's fair to assume that uh, fouling of the sensors, since they're in the same sludge, would, it, would occur at, at a similar rate. And so, although uh, the ultrasonic cleaning is very viable, they also do manual cleaning uh, at intervals every three months to six months. But with this uh, kind of this, uh, this feature right here enables them to uh, basically provide very consistent and reliable operation. What uh, topic on wastewater treatment monitoring wouldn't be complete with a little bit of on uh, aeration control? Um, and the application I'm going to describe here is something called uh, cascade aeration control. This type of control would be applied in locations where you have multiple individually controlled aerated cells and maybe a common set of blowers that distribute the air through those cells. And it consists of a lot of different components here, but of course it starts with a, a good, reliable dissolved oxygen measurement in an operator input set point. And so basically this controller right here compares those two values and uh, calculates an airflow set point. And then that airflow set point is compared with an online airflow meter and the valve here would be opened or closed to maintain that desired airflow to achieve the target DO concentration. 
And the same thing would go on this side. So each of these valves can be manipulated separately. Uh, upstream, because air, uh, with changes in the air demand rate, there'll be changes in the header pressure. And so a separate pressure controller is installed uh, in order to control the header pressure. The customer we're, we're featuring for this application is the Missoula, Montana Wastewater Treatment Plant. A little bit about Missoula. Uh, it's an advanced secondary treatment facility, including biological nutrient removal. The facility treats six to nine million gallons of wastewater daily. Uh, much of that wastewater is discharged to the Clark Fork River, um, but some of it is used to uh, irrigate a, a poplar tree farm, which you can see on the bottom uh, left of the figure right here. Missoula has been doing aeration control for a, a long time, and uh, prior to the most recent project, they actually used a traditional membrane-style DO probes. Um, and uh, basically, uh, when they upgraded to the optical, the FDO 700 IQ optical DO probes, they saw some real benefits, and one of those was uh, more control precision. Uh, let me explain. Uh, basically, with the traditional DO, um, there would be uh, relatively frequent problems with the DO probes, just based on their design. Membrane DO probes have uh, membranes and electrolyte, and uh, they need to be calibrated regularly. So when one of those probes would be basically the first, when something went wrong, that would be the first suspicion. So they'd go out to the aeration tank, check the probe, make any adjustments, and wait sometimes four hours, sometimes 24 hours before they made any further adjustments. With the optical probes, with the factory calibration and the very stable calibration, they know that that DO reading is right on. There is no concern for that, so they don't need to waste any time troubleshooting that. They can uh, start to look into other uh, potential problems. And so uh, they've achieved much higher reliability with the optical probes, uh, much less maintenance, basically from four hours per week down to one hour per week. And although it hasn't been quantified, um, I'm told that uh, from anecdotal evidence that the airflow since they put in the optical probes has overall been, been lower than it was before. The DO monitoring system consists of uh, 16 uh, optical DO probes installed in uh, four bioreactors. Uh, the four bioreactors have five aerobic cells each. And uh, the picture we see here is, first of all, uh, one of the DO probes in the aeration basin, at, and basically it's installed at the end of a PVC pipe. And then also in this picture, you can see where the air drop leg is and the air control valve. This is an important feature, which I'm going to uh, uh, discuss in a little bit more detail later. This is a 2020 XT controller. Now, even though the 2020 XT has 20 channels and would be more than capable of handling uh, 16 DO probes, for convenience and for uh, redundancy, they've chose to install a controller on each bioreactor. So you can see here they have four DO measurements um, for the, the one for one bioreactor. And besides that, it gives them capability to add additional probes. And they, and they do have additional probes, which they, they have uh, programmed into the 2020. A screenshot from the uh, uh, control system here shows the uh, airflow and the DO concentration in uh, basically bioreactor 2, which is divided into, uh, this one in particular is divided into seven different cells. The uh, airflow in DO in cell 2-4, it's not there. Well, that's because cell 2-4 is a swing zone. 
when they need more nitrification capacity, it's aerated. But in this picture, they, they have nitrification capacity and they're trying to optimize denitrification so it's not being aerated. But cells 2.5, 2.6, and 2.7 are aerated. And you can see with the blue line that they're being uh, very consistently controlled towards a target set point. And the airflow is also uh, very stable. Another thing that's noticeable from here is that uh, the airflow decreases as you move downstream. And that's because the oxygen demand is lower the further down the, the uh, bioreactor you get. So this is important because um, it's going to require less air in the downstream cells to achieve the same deal concentration as it does in the upstream cells. And this is a pretty viable part of a DO control system, providing the air where it's needed and in what quantity. A screenshot from the DO control system is, is shown here. And uh, if I can walk you through this a little bit, this is a bioreactor 3, which is a little different configuration. But you can see there are three cells right here which are not aerated. This is part of their biological nutrient removal system. But starting with cell 3, 4, uh, it is a swing zone. And again, the swing zone is it could be oxic or anoxic, depending on what the needs of the process are. On this particular day, it is a anoxic cell. In cell 5 and 6, and 6 is subdivided into A, B, and C, these are all uh, aerated. And you can see that each DO probe's reading with the airflow measurement and also the valve position indicator. On the right panel here, then, is um, uh, the status of each cell and the status of the overall system. The aeration system control is being based on the PLC right now. There are other options, but that's the normal mode of operation. Um, each individual cell, though, uh, may be manual. For it. In this case, cell 3, 4 is, is manual. It's, it's a swing anoxic zone in this example. But cells 3, 5, 3, 6A, 3, 6B, and 3, 6C are all uh, being controlled automatically with the DO probe. A few tips from Missoula. Uh, again, this is a common theme, but uh, operators were put in charge of pro maintenance. Again, for, for the benefits that um, uh, basically overall higher performance of the system. Uh, basically, it, it, it assigns some, some ownership. It's not just a task they're doing. It's something they're responsible. Uh, another uh, feature of the control system is that dissolved oxygen is monitored at the downstream end of the basin near where the aeration control valve is. And this is the most energy efficient configuration. Let me explain. So if you're monitoring uh, DO at the downstream end where the air valve is located, that's going to be the highest DO in the entire cell. Recall that the, the uh, oxygen demand decreases as you move down the cell. So that means there's going to be higher uptake upstream, lower upstream uptake downstream. So by locating the, the DO at the lowest uptake portion, you're going to have ensure that your DO is no higher than the set point at any location in that cell. The next application is um, chloramine disinfection. This is a fairly commonly used in wastewater treatment, but uh, basically um, it is uh, blending uh, chlorine with, with ammonia. And in this chart kind of shows um, chlorine and ammonia and then the chlorine to ammonia ratio. And in zone one right here, uh, the major reaction is the for formation of monochloramines. Remember that. However, downstream, you get less effective disinfectant reagents. And also, if you get past breakpoint, your chlorine residual starts to increase dramatically, requiring greater dechlorination chemical. So the reason this works 
or can be efficiently efficiently applied in wastewater is that, as we know, there is ammonia in wastewater. It's just part of the, what's uh, in in the wastewater. And in most cases, that ammonia is required to be removed. And so, uh, because it's required for chloramine disinfection, um, it provides an opportunity to use something in the wastewater to actually do the disinfection. The, the customer we're featuring today is the Littleton Englewood Wastewater Treatment Plant in Englewood, Colorado. Uh, Littleton Englewood is the third largest wastewater treatment plant in the state of Colorado. It's uh, wastewater from the cities of Englewood and Littleton in addition to 19 other districts. It's very large, as you see in the picture, and it's an advanced treatment plant required to exceed secondary treatment requirements for a design capacity of 50 million gallons per day. The current, they, currently, they're treating around 23 million gallons a day. The biological process is pretty complex. It consists of a trickling filter solids contact for BOD removal, nitrifying trickling filters for nitrification, and denitrifying filters for denitrification. The high quality effluent is discharged to the South Platte River. Now many years ago, Littleton Englewood switched to ORP control of their uh, disinfection system. Basically, the, the online wet chemistry residual analyzer they had was requiring a great deal of operator attention. And so um, they abandoned that before even putting it uh, into the control system. So they were, uh, instead they were using a grab samples and a DPD test kit, but they, they were finding there that they uh, were getting some interferences. Something in the wastewater was interfering with the tests. It was difficult to set the proper dosage, and the result is that sodium bisulfite was being overdosed just to assure compliance with their strict chlorine residual limit. A couple uh, photos from the ORP monitoring system. Uh, on the left panel is uh, our YSI ORP probes installed in the uh, downstream end of disinfection. And on the right-hand panel are the upstream ORP probes. So the upstream ORP probes are used for uh, chlorination control and our chlor chlorine, uh, chloramine disinfection control. And then the downstream probes are used for sodium bisulfite control. And the uh, objectives of their control system are a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, they want to maintain a certain amount of ammonia. R recall that if you, get too, if you get too high of a ratio of chlorine to uh, ammonia, you're going to end up in breakpoint chlorination, which is not desirable. Um, and they achieve this by bypassing treated wastewater around the nitrifying trickling filters. So they uh, assure that concentration that way. And, it's very, been very successfully applied to maintain final effluent E. coli of uh, 126 per 100 milliliters. A couple graphics here uh, explain how ORP is useful for chloramine disinfection. Um, so on the right-hand panel is ORP versus uh, concentration, residual chlorine concentration. And we can see that um, depending on the ORP value, you end up or depending on the product, you end up with a different ORP value. So, for example, free chlorine provides a much higher ORP than uh, monochloramine. And so, in the left-hand panel, we can kind of see what happens. Remember, I mentioned when they get into breakpoint chlorination. And in that case, uh, besides excessive sodium bisulfite usage, um, they end up with a very unstable ORP value, which makes the system very difficult to control. So as you can see, the system is switching from high ORP for free chlorine, lower uh, ORP for monochloramine. Um, a screenshot then from the uh, control system is, is shown here. And um, the denitrification filter effluent is combined with the uh, nitrifying trickling filter effluent. And those two wastewaters together, the target is to try to get them close to 1.5 milligram per liter ammonium. 
that waste wastewater flows into the chlorine contact tank where the uh, ORP probes are measuring there. And so um, they have a target uh, ORP of around 500 millivolts, which they, uh, which they control by adjusting the uh, sodium hypochlorite dosing. On the effluent end then, they also have uh, chlorine systems to control, or ORP sensors to control the sodium bisulfite system. In this case, the target is around 120 to 130 millivolts. And uh, basically, that is, is controlled by adjusting the dosage of sodium bisulfite. Littleton Englewood has been a IQ SensorNet customer for uh, a decade or longer. And they have a lot of experience with online process monitoring. And one thing that they, they have done um, at critical locations in the control system, they've installed redundant sensors. So you may have noticed that there were two ORP probes in the final effluent and there were two ORP probes upstream in the uh, upstream channel. And so basically this provides them um, greater assurance that their um, control system is responding appropriately. And also gives them a little redundancy in case there is a problem. They always have one good sensor in operation. Also, again, and again, this is a recurring theme, the plant operators maintain the instruments. And they formed this volunteer team called the Analyzer Task Force, or ATF for short. And each of three teams is responsible for cleaning, calibration, and parts replacement of a, of a particular set of uh, uh, process instrumentation. And all this is tracked through asset management to provide them uh, you know, the, the best uh, operation. The last uh, application we're featuring today is uh, nitrogen removal by biological denitrification. And this chart shows that ammonia that comes into the wastewater treatment plant under the right conditions is converted to nitrate. And that main condition for that really is to provide aerobic conditions. In other words, oxygen is required to uh, convert the ammonia to the nitrate. Under a different set of conditions then, that nitrate can be converted to nitrogen gas, which bubbles out of the system, and the nitrogen is removed. In this case, you need anoxic conditions, or unaerated, uh, very low DO conditions, and you need sufficient uh, carbon to drive that reaction. Our featured customer today is the uh, 26th Ward uh, wastewater treatment plant in New York City. The 26th ward is one of 14 uh, treatment plants in the uh, system there with a design capacity of eight, 85 million gallons a day. In total, the 14 plants treat 1.3 billion gallons of wastewater daily. The treatment process is required to remove nitrogen to relieve hypoxia and eutrophication of Long Island Sound, and particularly to protect the very sensitive uh, Jamaica Bay waters. A $2 million uh, nitrogen removal facility was recently completed that included nitrogen sensors to reduce discharges of nitrogen by 3,000 pounds per day. Complicating matters, this is a centralized solids handling facility handling solids from multiple other New York City facilities. In fact, one treatment train is dedicated to treatment of the ammonia-rich centrate. And so although this system has only been, the monitoring system has only been uh, installed for a few months now, uh, previous engineering reports identified uh, the potential savings from uh, automatic dosing of carbon based on nitrogen analyzers. So if we compare a couple of strategies here, constant flow was one scenario com compared, and there was the carbon usage and annual carbon cost. And then feed forward with data, with uh, information from online nitrate sensors, again, similar F, 
uh, them, they showed that calculated that the annual savings would be uh, $427,000. So well worth the investment in the nitrate monitoring system. So the, the monitoring system currently installed, a couple of the sensors are shown here. Uh, on the left panel is a uh, NitroVis optical nitrate sensor installed in the uh, aeration tank 2 mixed liquor. On the right panel is a, uh, in aeration tank 3, is a uh, nitrolite ISE nitrate sensor with air cleaning. The, there are three nitri nitrate sensors installed in each of three aeration tanks. Um, and the, uh, there is a nitrate sensor at the beginning of B-pass anoxic zone, at the beginning of C-pass anoxic zone, and at the end of the D-pass anoxic zone. And so the aeration tank three up here is dedicated to centrate treatment. So this is where the uh, dewatering centrate gets treated. And it's also where the nitrolite uh, ISE sensors are installed. A little bit about the carbon dosing control system. Um, the uh, New York City decided to use uh, glycerol as a carbon source. It has many advantages over traditional methanol, but um, this this here is a picture of a, it's not, not actually installed there, but of a typical glycerol storage system. So you can see um, they're they're anticipating to use a lot of carbon. Uh, their flow sheet is a step feed activated sludge system, so. Primary effluent is 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 uh, is discharged to the beginning of each of the four passes, and then um, carbon is dosed at the beginning of pass C and the beginning of pass D. They also have the capability. To, oops, sorry. They also have the capability to uh, discharge carbon into the beginning of pass B. And so that carbon dosage is based on the uh, nitrate readings. And so and it's based on the nitrate readings upstream, so the nitrate load entering the anoxic zone. This is a feed forward uh, control arrangement. The uh, nitrate sensors have only been installed for a, a very short time, but in the lead up to the um, process early on they decided that they were going to use optical nitrate sensors uh, in some locations and ISE nitrate sensors in other locations. And in this example the nitrate sensors, ISE nitrate sensors are installed in the centrate treatment tank where the nitrate concentrations are expected to be quite a bit higher. The New York City, the 26 ward system has air cleaning on the nitrolite sensor, but from other customers, um, they have chosen to also install air cleaning on optical nitrate sensors. Now, an uh, important feature of the optical nitrate sensors is that they have built-in ultrasonic cleaning, which does an excellent job of keeping the windows clean. But um, the, optical cl the ultrasonic cleaning is less effective with things like hair, and rags that uh, will occur in wastewater, particularly uh, plants that have ineffective wastewater screening upstream. So we have other customers who uh, have installed the supplemental air cleaning on the optical nitrate sensors in order to provide even more reliable performance. Well, uh, this concludes the applications, uh, but I do want to acknowledge all these people here who made it possible for us to create such an informative webinar. Uh, Rick Wenzel at the City of Brookfield, Doug Nolkember, Doug Nolkember at Johnson County, Mark Pedrotti 
who is uh, with Ari Pedrati, our rep in Missouri and Kansas. Uh, Gene Connell at the Missoula Wastewater Treatment Plant, Greg Farmer and John Wright at Littleton Englewood Wastewater Treatment Plant. Uh, Jim Hampson with Northeast Technical Sales, who is our uh, rep in New Jersey and New York. And David Fulcher with YSI Integrated Systems and Services. David is responsible for maintaining the probes at the 26th Ward Wastewater Treatment Plant. We presented a lot of information today. Uh, Rest assured, you'll be able to uh, view it on SlideShare later. But we're also going to create some printed, or well, some electronic content that you can download for free, uh, a case studies and solutions brochure. I'll look for it uh, to be advertised in the upcoming YSI Wastewater Newsletter. Uh, a web version of it should be available by the end of the month. Oh, also. Uh, I want to make sure you know about the IQ SensorNet trade-in program. Uh, you can get up to 20% off a 2020 XT system or 10% off a 182 system through December 31st, 2016. And this is a good time to change out your YSI or competitors' systems for a new uh, reliable monitoring system. More information can be found at the link shown on the slide here. Oops, well, um, I had one more slide here, but I'll just talk about it. I'm not sure where it went. Um, YSI, of course, is going to be at, at WEFTEC. Um, we'll be at, at booth 2529. That's with the rest of our Xylem companies. and. Uh, you can get more information in the meantime from uh, YouTube, uh, SlideShare, and of course, YSI.com. Uh, so uh, at this time, I'm going to stop talking, and uh, we'll try to, uh, we have a number of questions entered during the webinar. We'll try to answer as many of those as we can. If we don't get to your question today, we will um, answer it in a follow-up to the webinar. Thank you, Rob. Great presentation. Um, so yeah, we're going to go through uh, just probably a few questions since we're, we've only got about four minutes left here uh, um, until the hour's up. So um, thanks for all your great questions. And like Rob said, if we, we don't get to your question, we will be sure to follow up with you. Yeah, I, I see a few of the, the questions here. Um, here's one. Um, could you please explain or elaborate the point you mentioned on where the DO probe has to be placed in an aeration basin? I think you said it would be ideal to place the DO probe in the downstream of the aeration basin as it has the lowest uptake of oxygen. Could you please explain why it has to be placed in the downstream? Well, it, it doesn't have to be uh, placed in the downstream. Actually, the DO probe can be placed anywhere. And it will depend also on where the uh, aeration control is located. So in this case, the point I was making was that um, for the highest energy efficiency, you would want to locate the uh, DO probe at the downstream end of the basin where the uh, aeration supply pipe is located or the aeration control valve is located. Um, so think of it that uh, if, you, if you set a DO, let's say you use the same set point and you move that DO probe to the midpoint of the basin, the, you would maintain a DO of 2 milligram per liter at that midpoint, but at the back end of the basin would be a higher DO concentration because there would be lower uh, oxygen demand. So because you can only control to one measurement in the cell, you have to decide what your treatment, of, what your objectives are. And if energy efficiency is that objective, the simplest method would be to locate that probe at the downstream end. Um, okay, I have one other 
question here that I can an try to answer here. Um, where redundant sensors are installed, I know we talked about Littleton Englewood there, uh, does the controller use the average value or one of the sensors? How does the controller ignore a bad reading from a sensor? Well, I'm going to talk specifically about the Littleton application. Um, again, you, you can do it however you want it to be, but in the case of, of Littleton, uh, Littleton uses one or the other. So they decide which one they're going to use. And in fact, uh, particularly for ORP, they actually may actually program in uh, different ORP set points for those. Uh, the controller, um, how does, and the, the second question, how does the controller ignore a bad reading from a sensor? Well, that part actually is done manually. So uh, the plant is actually also doing some offline monitoring. And so they're kind of keeping tabs on things and they're using the uh, they are choosing to use a sensor that they feel is giving them the the best control. I, I suppose there there are other ways to do it, but that's that's how it was done in that application. Um, we we have time for for one more question, and um, I'm going to. Uh, pick from the, a number that we got right here. Um, well, th this is, um, okay, I'm going to clarify something from uh, one of the, uh, the screens we showed. Um, you may have noticed that um, the ortho P measurement on the, uh, for the uh, Brookfield, Wisconsin application was topping out at around two milligram per liter on the display for the chemical P removal application. And, and so um, recall that that picture was actually from the customer side SCADA system. And so the, uh, the phosphate analyzer is capable of measuring up to 15 milligram per liter, but the outputs which were set, uh, these are current outputs, 4 to 20s basically, that were being, what were programmed, were programmed deliberately to uh, provide a maximum signal at 2 milligram per liter. And that was because that was really the, the, the limit of their control. If it got to be, um, obviously 2 milligram per liter is, is really high and they're probably going to want to ramp that pump up to its, its highest rate. There was really no additional benefit from giving uh, monitoring concentrations at higher levels. What that does give them though is with the output that setting though, that gives them a little higher resolution because now those 16 milliamps are divided uh, between only two milligram per liter and not over the entire measuring range, which is 15. Good question. Thanks, Rob. And thank you uh, to our audience for attending today's webinar. We hope that you found it useful. And if you don't mind, please take a few minutes here at the end uh, to complete the survey and let us know how we can better serve you. And we really appreciate all these great questions today. And unfortunately, we were not able to get to all of them. So we will follow up with you in, um, in direct response to your questions. So once again, thank you. And uh, we will see you at the next webinar. <laughs>